Welcome to the final Humanities Forum of the semester. I'm so glad you all could join us today, especially in its unusual time slot, Thursday instead of Friday. Um, we're particularly honored today to partner with the Jewish Catholic Theological Exchange here at PC, and I'll welcome uh, Arthur Urbano to introduce our host this afternoon in just a moment. Let me say a little bit, though, about how this, a this afternoon will work, since a film screening is a little unusual for us. We'll um, introduce the film, our host will introduce the film for just a few minutes, and then we'll start it and we'll watch all the way through. And it's a little under two hours. And then at the end, by the time the film's over, uh, we have some pizza that's gonna be delivered from off campus, you'll be happy to know, uh, which will be set up in the back of the room by the end of the film. We'll take a short break for everybody to get something to eat, and we'll, we'll pretty much stay here unless a couple of you need to take a, a restroom break, which is fine. And then we'll have a conversation for about a half hour on the film before we dismiss for the day. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here. And now please welcome Professor Arthur Urbano from the Theology Department and the Jewish Catholic Theological Exchange to introduce our host this afternoon. Thank you, Raymond, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to, great to see you here. Um, really happy to have this uh, opportunity to uh, team up with the Humanities Forum uh, to host today's uh, screening and discussion of uh, Women in Gold. Um, and especially happy to have uh, Dr. Deborah Johnson uh, to be our uh, discussion leader and facilitator uh, today. She spent several years uh, on our committee, and uh, it's always a, a, a pleasure uh, to work and collaborate with her. Um, I just wanted to say a few things about the Jewish Catholic Theological Exchange uh, here at uh, PC. Uh, we established it uh, a little over 10 years ago now. It's hard to believe it's, uh, it's been that long. Um, and uh, our mission uh, is to foster interreligious learning, um, dialogue, and uh, collaboration uh, between Jews and Christians. Uh, we have a, a website uh, on our PC webpage. I figured I'd take a screenshot and, and show it to you. You can um, go to our website uh, to learn about some of our um, upcoming uh, events. And even though the semester is almost over, we do have a couple of things uh, coming up, uh, one of which is next week, um, uh, next Wednesday, uh, April 25th, uh, we have a, um, a dialogue um, discussion between uh, Rabbi David Novak, who is kind of a leading figure uh, in uh, Jewish-Christian dialogue, uh, and one of our own uh, Dominicans, uh, Father Thomas Joseph White, who's now at the uh, Dominican House of Studies down in Washington, D.C., but was a faculty member here uh, in the theology department um, uh, several years ago. Uh, and they'll uh, be discussing uh, the topic of uh, supersessionism, uh, which is a very important big topic uh, in uh, Jewish-Christian relations. So if you're able to make that, uh, please join us uh, next Wednesday. And also on, on May 2nd, uh, so in a couple of weeks, um, our, uh, we'll also be sponsoring uh, the premiere screening of a documentary film uh, that was produced by uh, myself, I, it's not what I normally do, but uh, it was a new thing for me, um, and Dr. Jennifer, Jennifer Aluzzi in the History Department, a documentary called uh, Sons of Providence. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, um, a story about the admission of Jewish students to Providence College in its earliest decades, so in the 20s, 30s, really through the 1960s. Um, and we were able to um, interview several of those alumni, uh, who, some of whom are well into their 90s now, uh, and get their stories about why they chose PC and what their experience uh, was like uh, here uh, so many decades ago. Uh, and I just found out today, one of them from the class of 1941, I think, will be in attendance. I think he's like 97 or <laughs> something like that. Um, so so some, of these, some of these guys, these alumni, uh, will be here for that. So that's May 2nd uh, in this room um, at 6 p.m. So um, we'd love to see you there uh, as well. Um, it's a pleasure for me today to um, introduce uh, Dr. Deborah Johnson, who's Professor of Modern and Contemporary Material Culture uh, at Providence College and teaches in the Art History, Black Studies, and Women's Studies Department, the latter of which she helped to found. She's the author of numerous articles, museum catalogs, and scholarly books, including Women Making Art, Women in the Visual, Literary, and Performing Arts Since 1960. 
uh, the second edition of which will be published in 2019 with five new chapters. That's great. Um, her most recent articles concern uh, the tracing of the African uh, dia diasporic roots of Harlem Renaissance painter Aaron Douglas and the situating of the feminist politics of cultural icon Beyonce. For the past five years, uh, Professor Johnson has participated in multiple Catholic Jewish uh, dialogue initiatives, and I, I should say, as I said before, it's been a real uh, privilege uh, and honor to work with, uh, with Deborah on, on, on many of these, and for that I'm very grateful. Um, uh, Professor Johnson has lectured widely on uh, art of the Holocaust uh, and earned a degree in Jewish sacred music from Hebrew College, and she is also the cantor uh, of her synagogue, Temple Sinai, uh, in Cranston. Uh, so would you join me uh, in welcoming uh, Dr. Jebra Johnson? Thanks so much, Arthur. Arthur is such a good guy, and the events he plans are really wonderful. Thank you for being here. I really hope you enjoy the film. It is an important film, for sure. Just a little background, it is a 2015 biographical film based on a true story, the true story of Maria Altman, who was an elderly Jewish refugee in Los Angeles. Together with her young lawyer, Randy Schoenberg, she fought the government of Austria for almost a decade to reclaim Gustav Klimt's iconic painting of her aunt, the portrait of Adele Block Bauer. This painting, along with four others, was literally ripped from the walls of their home in their presence by Nazis as part of a campaign of theft from Jews who it was reasoned would be soon dead anyway. The Nazis then gave the portrait to the Austrian National Gallery and it had since grown from that moment of transferal of, transferal of ownership, there's a sanitized phrase, transferal of ownership from uh, the Blockbauer family through the Nazis to the Austrian government, the Austrian National Gallery to the point when, when uh, Maria Altman rediscovers the painting it had become a virtual icon of Vienna. Gustav Klimt is inarguably the most significant painter that Austria has ever produced. And this particular portrait came to stand for the city. And this particular portrait very much became Vienna's Mona Lisa. Not incidentally, it was valued at over $100 million. So what the movie will do is to trace Altman taking her legal battle all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, where in 2004, they rule on appeal in favor of her reclamation of this family painting um, following Austria's decision which had ruled against her. A little more background, the fact is, ironically, Hitler cared a whole lot about art. Uh, he himself was a failed art student from uh, in Vienna before he turned to politics. Uh, he essentially dropped out of art school in what would have been his junior year in college. As early as 1929, as the elected Führer, he began to purge Germany's museums of works that he designated as Antarctica, degenerate, and invariably destroyed them, and mostly for the theater of it, mostly burned them. Those works that were identified as Antarctica were works whose uh, content didn't in some way support the ideological agenda of the Nazi regime. And on this list of ideological, uh, on this list of degenerate artists, and remember that this is a time when content is almost invisible in art as art for art's sake takes over. On this list of degenerate artists were all the greats actually of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Picasso, Matisse, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Kandinsky, and on and on. These works, numbering into the thousands, were lost for all time. By 1938, Hitler was no longer stealing works to destroy, but was engaged in an organizing looting campaign of German, Austrian, and Polish Jewish art collections whose works he would keep as his own or that he would give as rewards to his officers or most often, he would keep 
and use for his planned Führer Museum, which he hoped would be the biggest and perhaps even the only significant museum um, of art from the history of civilization, again called the Führer Museum. It was to be built in his honor in his hometown of Linz, Austria. By 1940, of course, he's moving on to France, uh, and France, as the center of the art world, becomes a major source for Hitler's avaricious, bless you, avaricious uh, acquisition of art. In fact, who's been to the Jeux de Pomme in Paris? Oh, it's lots of my art history folks and then some others. The Jeux de Pomme is, and of course, uh, Connie, uh, the Jeux de Pomme is a major museum in Paris now, largely of contemporary art. The entire Jeux de Pomme was cleared out of works and used for looted Jew Jewish collections in Paris, ultimately totaling 16,000 art objects, again, all looted from private Jewish collections. This, by the way, this number 16,000 is more than the entire European painting collection in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Uh, folks in the Louvre uh, were terrified uh, that it was a matter of time uh, before their institution was looted as well. And as a consequence, they also emptied out their museum. Um, there are some very poignant images of uh, the Nike of Samothrace, the, Mo the Mona Lisa, being carted out in the rain and the snow to be hidden underground and otherwise. Um, however, Hitler's interest was less on public collections except for Germany, and more on the availability, the clear availability of art collections of Jews who are being deported to concentration camps. Ultimately, over 22,000 pieces of art were shipped from Paris to Berlin by uh, the Nazi looting staff that numbered into the thousands. The staff numbered into the thousands. To this day, I can assure you uh, that there is not a major museum in Western Europe or in America that is not holding works looted from Jewish art collections. Some of these museums have begun to post databases of works that entered their hands post-World War II with a weak or, or non-existent provenance, and provenance is a word that means history of ownership, or worse, works that are recorded as having passed through Nazi hands. And we're learning more and more which dealers were actually helping to launder these works. Um, in my own history, when I was a consultant to a major art collector in New York um, in the 1970s, um, I, in fact, unknowingly contributed to laundering a looted artwork from a Jewish collection. Uh, ultimately, it wasn't restituted, but it took it was restituted, but not for two decades. Um, and I had missed, I've gone over this in my head so many times, I believe I had missed that one of the owners of this particular piece uh, had been a collection in Switzerland that had laundered Nazi looted artworks. Some of these museums that have posted databases to which we all can go to see if we recognize something from our grandparents' collections. Some of them have pledged to make returns, although more often these cases end up in the courts. Those who are honestly engaging in the return of works uh, are doing so as a direct legacy of the Altman case, this case we're going to, uh, to learn about and be entertained by in this movie, um, and the systematic theft of art from individual Jewish owners that the Altman case and Maria Altman herself helped to reveal. Um, so as not to miss the obvious, Woman in Gold was the nickname um, of this portrait in contention, the portrait of Maria Altman's aunt, Maria Block Bauer. Um, I have several questions after the film. I hope you'll stick around so that we can uh, discuss the specifics of the film, but also um, the general notion of how museums historically have gotten their collections um, and uh, should be a lively discussion. So we should begin the film. This movie is not about a work of art. It's a wonderful work of art. Obviously, it's not about the money. The, the, the figure was quite handsome. Uh, Nowhere near the record. The record, I don't even know. 
Okay, well, still, you know, not, not chicken feed. It's about what we do with the past. Uh, at least uh, I'd like to hear the discussion, hear discussion uh, frame uh, directed to that. Interesting question, and three times in the movie, one or another character, and finally, um, Maria Altman herself says, let the past be the past. Any thoughts about that? That is the question, isn't it? That is one of several questions. Do we let, are there times, are there times when it's appropriate to let it go, and are there times when it's not, and how do you make the decision? I'll have to quiet down. Um, well, part of part of it would be what generation are you in, right? So the the main character, protagonist, male guy, um, finally confront like co finally confronted his own sort of cultural memory. So it's sort of this idea of can we let go of you know, or have we already let go of something if we haven't experienced it, or if we haven't been handed something directly, is it still ours kind of thing, right? So she's sort of repressing maybe some of her past in some ways, but s so is he in a way. So I think there's kind of that, that question of, 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 of what pa the past is. Is it a, a cultural past, a universal past, or d is it a personal past, right? And of, of course, we're losing the very last survivors who are, are are now if not already dead certainly aged and the rallying cry uh, yeah, there was lots of holocaust deniers until the 1960s a lot of survivors actually finally confronted uh, in themselves as well as in the general culture the nazi past and their own own experiences as pushback to what had been um, reconsiderations about the about the nazi history the the you know rewriting of history essentially and the denial of the Holocaust and the camps. Um, and that's when survivors themselves began speaking. But their rallying cry was forgive, never forget. Uh, that kind of keeps the past alive for, uh, for forever. Um, let me bring it to art, though. Let me bring it back to art, although I completely agree with my colleague Phil that this is about more than art. Um, who knows the Elgin Marbles? Who knows? Okay, Jacqueline, did you see the Elgin marbles? Where? In the British Museum in London. What was it doing there? Um, Where Lord, did it come from? It comes from ancient, um, ancient times in Greece and Athens, and Lord Elgin kind of found them after um, the Parthenon had been destroyed and Greece kind of just left them lying there. Yeah, so the re that's excellent. Thank you, Jack Jacqueline. So the rhetoric goes, actually. Um, the Parthenon, of course, is not destroyed. It's been attacked many, many times since the 16th century. Um, and uh, the Elgin marbles themselves actually had to be removed from the Parthenon. Lord Elgin had uh, a, an army of um, art, quote unquote, restorers that forcibly removed those marbles those sculptures. And the nation of Greece has been trying to get them back since the 1960s. And much like Maria Altman, only on a very much grander scale and for a longer period of time, um, the Greek government has attempted to sue the British government for the return of the Elgin marbles. Who goes to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts? Anybody been to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts? Yeah. Um, one of their premier collections is their ancient Egyptian department. Um, the ancient Egyptian collection at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts is one of the three best collections of Egyptian art in the world, besting the one in Cairo, in fact. How did they get their art? Well, in 1926, from 1926 to 29, 
um, at about the same time that Tutankhamun was being, the grave of Tutankhamun was being excavated, uh, a curator at the MFA decided to put together um, an expedition of lay people and curators to go to Egypt to quote unquote save or rescue uh, the art. As a consequence, they ended up bringing back to them, with them, again, an exquisite, hello, how are you? My old friend over there. An exquisite collection of Egyptian art. Um, why don't we call this looting or theft? Why don't we call what Lord Elgin did looting or theft? Why don't we call what the, uh, the folks at the MFA in 1926-29 did looting or theft? This is not an ingenuous question. I honestly don't know the answer. Why aren't we calling it theft? Lily, I feel like Oprah Winfrey. Um, well, I guess it could be because like there was no one there to take claim to what they found, especially with like the, the marbles. Like there was no one that originally cared for them or made them to take claim to them. So they just knew they were you know, priceless art and that they needed to be cleaned up and put somewhere. And because they found them, they claimed them as their own, I guess, in a way. Interesting answer. So what's the difference between what happened to Jews in the Holocaust and what happened to the Egyptian collections at the MFA? What happened with the Elgin marbles? Uh, what happened with so much Japanese in particular and African art that's made its way to this country? Again, more of it found in this country than in their countries of origin. Is there a difference? And if there isn't a difference, what about that other remark in the movie that said we can't open the floodgates? If we say yes to this, we'll say yes to everything. There is not a museum on earth that has not been founded and fed by theft and looting. So what's the difference? Yeah, Herb. I don't, there really isn't uh, a difference. It's sort of uh, uh, in the, 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 the Great, Great Britain was a colonial power mm -hmm. and uh, France was a muscular colonial power, Spain was and uh, they get to, so it's, uh, it's- And so were the Nazis, and, powerful. Right, so to whom, to whom did, uh, uh, did, the, did the homegrown patriots in those countries, Greece, again, to whom were they gonna complain? Mm -hmm. and, and to what effect would, would there have been? The, uh, to the victors get to write the history anyway. Mm -hmm. And, in, and, um, and they could have written any justification as Lord, whether El Elgin ever actually did, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But you know, we take them to protect them was probably the, 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 the usual explanation. So this movie pulled at our heartstrings, and yet it's difficult to parse out why looted art from Jews should be restituted, but the Elgin marbles shouldn't, unless we think of it in the terms that Herb is suggesting. You want to re repeat those terms? You were getting to a place where you were making a distinction between the Egyptian collections et al. and looted art from Jewish collections. Well, I, I guess you're referring to the to the to the uh, justification, mm -hmm. saying that saying that if we leave this stuff here, it'll be harshly treated or forgotten or or stolen and sold off, yeah. and we whichever we will protect it and, and honor it. Yeah. yeah, in fact, yeah, uh, in terms of justification, there isn't, a, there isn't a, a museum who hasn't acquired its works through theft or looting that hasn't justified it, as Jacqueline began our discussion, as an element of protection. Let's save it from its people, let's save let's save it from itself, um, and yes, that's paternalistic, and yes, we could interrogate that to death. We could certainly critique that. Um, there are many folks who would disagree that uh, the marbles were removed for their own good, for instance, um, and yet there's no doubt that these works were fully stolen, fully looted against the will um, of their owners. 
Yeah. The art was looted from nations. So the plaintiff was not as specific. But these were individual collections. And so it takes a long time for governments to get their act together and to try and figure out what they've lost and what they're going to fight for. Mm -hmm. But it, it's different when it's personal. Yeah. yeah, it's different when it's personal, absolutely. Um, what about the floodgates, though? Yeah. My son asked me to ask a question for him. He wants to know if Egypt is suing us. Ah. Uh, the, it, the, I've been to the Cairo Museum three times. The first time was before, do you know about the Arab Spring? There's, there have been a series of revolutions in the Arab world around North Africa, um, and largely perpetrated by terrorist groups or counterculture groups. Do you have any idea what those are? Not by, the, not by the government in any case. The first time I was in the Cairo Museum, you walk into the big room, the big gallery in the Cairo Museum, and it's all of the stuff is from King Tut's tomb, and it's all gold, gold everywhere. Actually, you have to cover your eyes practically. At least I started to get a headache from all the gold. The entire room is yellow and golden and flooded with gold. Second time? Um, I was there, there were a few discrete uh, pieces removed. Third time I was there, much of what was I had seen the first time was gone. And that was because they were anticipating that their own people were gonna loot the museums. That's of course, in fact, what's happened. Not only have uh, terrorist groups blown up important national mon monuments in their own countries, but people have been looting their own institutions in their own countries at vulnerable moments. Uh, so I guess they don't need us to loot them um, fundamentally. But what about this issue of floodgates? What happens if we give all of the African art that we have, particularly religious art, back to Africa? What happens if we give the full range of 19th and 20th century Japanese prints, which the Japanese government ga gave up under pressure from the canons of our own Rhode Island Commodore Perry. What if we gave all those Japanese prints back to Japan? Um, what kind of precedent does this set? Um, would that be a good thing? Should they all, should they all go back to where they belong? Is this a practical question or a moral question? Yeah, Kelly. I didn't run this morning, so I'm getting my run in now. Um, I think it's more of like an economic and sort of like cultural or sort of like problem as well. Like in regards to like the African art, um, there was um, the artworks were stolen like decades ago, like in the 1920s and the early 1900s. There's been cultures that have switched and sort of like regions that have been like destroyed and so also switched places. So there's more than 54 countries in, Afri in Africa. So we don't actually know which artworks or which pieces go to which. And also it has problems with the government there as well. So it, there also might not be correct placement of those artworks as well. And if all the artworks and pieces were supposed to be given to each um, country region, the museums that like mostly have them now would probably be mostly left empty. So there would probably be like lawsuits, courts, everything. So I don't think it will happen immediately, but I guess like there are attempts for it to like start. Yeah, Kelly's making several good points, one of which we need to underscore because it's one of the arguments against restitution, and we're talking collective restitution, not individual restitution, um, and that is we have, we no longer have a real record of where so much of this stuff comes from and where it should go back to. That's again an argument um, that in a lot of cases is missing from the discussions and the cases of Jewish looted art. Um, was this a good movie? Who liked this movie? Okay. Um, 
somebody synopsize for me the takeaway from this movie. Shannon, can I go to you? Thank you so much. Um, well, it kind of made me think of like the issue with the Guernica and um, kind of the the kind of the issue of who owns art because the piece that they focused on um, became like a cultural artifact to Vienna, um, but it wasn't rightfully theirs in the first place. So it kind of made me think of that big question, who owns art? Does it belong to the culture of which it is a part of or does it belong to, um, like with the Guernica, like the museum that had it or like in this case um, the person who rightfully owns it yeah that's a good question so what was your takeaway what was your takeaway just the cultural significance of the yeah and does that trump does cultural significance religious significance of artworks trump any question of ownership Yes, sir. Tell me your name. I should remember. I've forgotten. Tell me. Christian. Christian, of course. I think it depends. Um, in this case, I think the movie would be different if they showed, like, it's kind of hard to explain. If they showed, like, a young 18-year-old who seems wild, I think it would be hard for the audience to, <coughs> how do I put this, like, the work of art is over $100 million, so I don't, I think there could be like an age or like some sort of means on who it belongs to. But in terms of in this movie where Vienna, um, I didn't really see like an outlash from the public. Um, so I thought it was interesting that they didn't show that. Um, so I just think it depends. Like in this movie, if Vienna was like, the public was outraged and everything, I do think the outcome would be different. Um, so I do think, um, in my opinion, since um, she had such, since we saw her connection, I think it would be rightfully belongs to her. So I don't think the public um, has a decision, but when it comes to like their, the person's age or like, I don't, I don't know, like if, I do think it would be different if um, the person had no knowledge of the art and they just knew that they were a relative. But since I saw that it was important to her, I do, do think it belongs to her, so. You make a good point. And Shannon, I should underscore, um, mentioned perhaps our most famous case of restitution, and that is um, Picasso, Pablo Picasso was asked in 1937 to represent the Spanish government. He, of course, was a Spanish painter, but he'd moved to France, never left France again, but did not refuse to, refuse to relinquish his Spanish citizenship. In any case, um, France sort of was sticking it to Spain in 1937. Uh, by asking Picasso to represent Spain in the World's Fair. Um, and uh, Spain was outraged, um, and Picasso chose as his subject the recent bombing of a small village in the Basque country that was said to house um, guerrilla fighters fighting against Generalissimo Franco and against the Nazi fighter pilots that had bombed this area in the Basque country. Um, turned out that there were no terrorists in that area and there were just scores and scores of women and children left in the village. Um, in any case, Picasso painted the work, it's an incredibly important work, and said that, um, well, he wanted he had Nazi soldiers living with him when he, uh, when the Germans invaded um, Paris. And in fact, he moved to the south where there was a local government that was a little bit more relaxed and he thought he would be safer, uh, but he knew his Guernica was not safe because it was an anti-Nazi statement. In fact, uh, he, he had a huge house in the south of France and a Nazi soldier at one point came up and took his, his one of his whips or whatever the heck it was uh, like a riding crop, and sla slammed or slapped Guernica and said to Picasso, did you do this? And Picasso said, no, you did, um, which was very powerful, but he knew that that painting was now in, in grave danger. So he, uh, he arranged to have it moved to the Museum of Modern Art, saying that if at any point 
Spain was free um, of fascism, this work would be, uh, should be sent back to Spain as a piece of cultural patrimony. Uh, there, is, there was a point, obviously, in Spanish history when fascism was not operative. Uh, the Spanish government attempted to reclaim from the Museum of Modern Art the Guernica, which was a major exhibition draw for the Museum of Modern Art, this, this painting. Um, and uh, New York, the Museum of Modern Art, the city of New York, state of New York, fought it and fought it and fought it and fought it for years. And finally, they got a new director who said, this just doesn't belong to us. It really does belong to the people of Spain. He wasn't saying, we know what Picasso's wishes were. He said, this piece belongs to Spain. The piece was returned to Spain. Uh, there, the, it, there were hundreds of people to welcome the painting back when it arrived in Madrid. There was, uh, you know, there was an army guard, um, and it's now in the National Gallery in Madrid where it takes center, center stage. So um, restitution has begun in this country uh, about 50 years ago. Um, and restitution still continues primarily around this issue of Nazi looted um, Jewish works as increasingly survivors' families are seeing pictures uh, of works that they can document with pictures of their own from their ancestral home that those works uh, were, in their, were in their house. Other thoughts? Yeah, Arthur. Just sort of thinking about the question of, you know, say the Elgin, Elgin marbles and <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Nazi looting, and is it the same situation, this, the different situation? You know, it, it, it seems like with the Nazi looting, there is an obvious enemy, right? There is an obvious evil, right, that everyone can pretty much agree on. But it gets much more difficult when you start talking about, you know, the British Empire and the West, right, because um, the people are, are going to be less uh, ready to label that an obvious evil, right? Uh, it, it, analogous to, uh, to to Nazism, and it's so I mean it's so complicated, right? I mean I'm thinking in in a in a few weeks I'm I'm taking a um, uh, a group of students to the Yale Art Gallery to see the remains of a third century church, which had been excavated um, in the 20s um, in Syria. Um, so on the one hand, right, we have the you know, the opportunity to, to visit something and, and see so, something that we otherwise would probably not have much access to. Uh, on the other hand, right, it's something that was sort of readily and easily lifted from, from the Syrian people um, uh, for, you know, for, for our Western benef benefit to, to, but then it gets more complicated, right, because you, you look at the situation of Syria today, right? And uh, the very site where this was taking, taken from had become a, uh, an ISIS um, training camp of some sort. Uh, and one wonders if it hadn't been taken, right, would it have survived or would it have not? You know, so, so it's, you know, on the one hand, the removal allows, a, a, it dem also democratizes it in a sense. It's, it's, it, you know, it makes it accessible at least to a certain group of people. But on the other hand, it's also robbing other people of their, um, their cultural heritage, their identity, uh, and so on. But then what do we do when even that, that cultural identity, if it's left in an obviously dangerous area? Is there, so in other words, is there, is there a moral obligation then right, uh, when it is in danger uh, to remove it? Because you know, ISIS and others have destroyed, as you mentioned, destroyed and, and, and themselves have put things on the black market. And, um, are themselves sort of creating a cultural genocide of sorts in, in Syria. Yeah. Yeah. And I think those are justifiably complex cases. Um, I, I, I mentioned to you that I unwittingly um, laundered a piece of, of Jewish, of, of Nazi looted art, and I don't, I, I think I was giving myself a break. I don't, I don't really think it was unwitting. I was, uh, I, I was a consultant that meant a buyer for a, for a, major collector in New York. And collectors usually are very systematic about their collections. It's not like they see something they like and they say, oh, I'll buy that. They're usually, they usually are a little obsessive compulsive to begin with. And they'll think about holes in their collections and we've got to 
you know, fill this hole and we've got to fill this hole. This lovely, lovely man who was a, a Jewish refugee himself actually from Hungary um, was collecting 19th century French drawings, um, very, very pricey things. And he for decades had wanted a very obscure thing. He wanted a pastel over monotype by Degas. Now, Degas is a big name, but this thing about a pastel over monotype, Degas only made 14 of them. They're small, they were rare, um, and we were, Emile and I were always on wild goose chases for this Degas. Um, I found one um, and showed it to him with not the picture, not the actual monotype, obviously, but that it was coming up at auction, showed it to him. Um, and uh, we all were very excited. There, he had no limit on, on what he could spend. He was prepared to spend a whole lot, and he did not have a limit. This is gonna be the crown of his collection. And he was, an, he was a nice man and an, and an old man, and this was gonna make him so happy. Um, and so what I do, did as a consultant is I then check the provenance. You worry about buying a forgery. Um, you know, having somebody spend a lot of money for a forgery. And so did the research to assure myself it, was one, it really was one of the original 14. Then you check the provenance as a way of also checking the authenticity of the work. You know, if there's no history of this piece ever having been owned, um, you know there's a problem. Um, and there had been a long history, actually since Degas, it came out of Degas' studio on his, in his, on his death in the, in the early 20th century, um, and then it bounced around for a while and that was fine. And then the provenance, the history just dropped away for 10 years, late 30s, early 40s, just dropped away. Uh, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find where it had gone after that. Um, and the next step was a dealer in Switzerland um, and not a well-known de dealer, not a dealer that was around anymore. Um, and the name was familiar, and the name was familiar. And it's the kind of thing, you know, sometimes you can't remember something, but it just gives you a queasy feeling in your stomach and you don't know why because you can't remember it. Well, the name of this gallery just sort of gave me a queasy feeling. But I was so excited for Emile to get this work. I didn't do my due diligence. I didn't investigate that sick feeling in my stomach. It was just a light sick feeling. It wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna, you know, be nauseated all over the place. And we just got excited and the auction was like imminent and I didn't do the research. And he bought it, he got it. Um, and then uh, when he passed away, which was just a few years after that, he passed the work on in his will to his daughter. Um, and as those works, he had a large collection, as those works were passing, um, we did more work on it. and. It, and published it. I did a catalog of his work, and someone recognized that particular Degas monotype with a pastel overdrawing. It had belonged to her great great aunt um, in France and had been stolen uh, by the Nazis. And I should have known. So I should have known. I should have, I should have known. Um, I'd obviously encountered the name of that gallery, and I didn't pursue it. And that's when greed interfered. So where your situations are, the situations you cited are complicated, there are others that are much clearer. Um, I made a mistake, I, I, you know, I let greed take over. Even worse, I think, when I, was, when I was working at a museum, and this museum has to go unnamed, um, there was a huge hole in the collection around uh, art of the Americas, and particularly South America. And um, if you're looking for art from particular countries, you know what the paradigmatic archetypal art is and you want to get that. Well, the textile curator got offered um, an exquisite Peruvian textile. Um, and this is not so unusual. She had to go to Peru and she had to meet somebody at midnight and um, you know, there was a very peculiar exchange of money, but uh, she took cash, actually. She took $50,000 in cash, um, went down to Peru, met someone at midnight, and this individual who she met um, said, we're gonna, he, we're gonna go pick up this, this textile. Um, and he takes her to a cemetery and he starts digging up a body. Um, 
And it, he knew his cemeteries, and he knew what would be there because he digs up a body, and there's a gorgeous textile wrapped around this body. Um, he unwraps the body. He gives her the textile. And does she say, this is the most grotesque thing I've ever encountered? I'm going to take you to jail? No. Greed takes over. She said, great, here's your money. I'm on my way. I mean, on some, on some level, the fact that it was clearly authentic and had no provenance, I guess, had no provenance that needed to be researched, I guess must have been a relief. In any case, she gets stopped in customs with this major textile um, and gets incarcerated uh, for a couple of weeks until the director pays a comparable amount to the customs officials. Uh, something like another 50,000 to get her out and get the textile out also. The textile is now hanging proudly in a gallery in this particular nameless museum having been ripped off the body of an ancient Peruvian. You know, in that case, these things are clear. That's, that's not complicated. Um, and in many ways, I think the issue, the Nazi issue, the Nazi looted issue is clear for equally for all the reasons you've cited. Um, you know, the fact that we're dealing with individuals, the fact that it is, was clearly coercive, the fact that uh, it's not nation, uh, it's not nation against nation, but nation against the individual. Um, I wanna get back to Phil though and ask him to answer his own question. Do we forget? It's a hard question. Uh, I mean, there are wounds, they don't, I'm, this is true personally as well as collectively. There are wounds that uh, won't go away. Uh, on the other hand, there is a possibility that you exacerbate your wounds by dwelling on them. And I think a lot of the movie uh, was about that rather than that splendid piece of art. Incidentally, I just heard an argument for the Austrians in this discussion. Art belongs to the people. This is an Austrian, Austrian piece of art. It belongs to the Austrian people. I don't find it terribly persuasive, but there it is. Thank you very much for coming, and I do hope you enjoyed it.